So I'm, I'm um, uh, last year PhD student. I have to uh, to end it in September uh, under the supervision of uh, of Suna Damon, uh, as you can see on, on the slides. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I worked on this. Uh, I mean, maybe you've heard about the life to make paper. Uh, I didn't work on this paper, but I work on the same project with the um, registry data in, in Denmark. And uh, this project comes from this data, although we were not planning to, to do that at all at the beginning, it's just like something that we kind of discover uh, playing around with the data. Cool. So yeah, they go with, with the presentation? Yeah, I think it's, it's, oh, it's yes. time to get, get started. So how is this water? Yeah, so the the Talk of the title is Houses Are Water. The, the real talk of uh, the preprint uh, is uh, composing geographical and universal aspects of, of human mobility. And uh, the big point I want to make is that, um, I mean, in the recent years, there was a lot of search in uh, work on human mobility, mainly due to uh, phone data or GPS data. But the point is that in most of this work, people don't really always take into account geography. And uh, what you can see here is a map of France. Uh, in this map, we didn't plot any borders or administrative unit or, I don't know, elevation. It's actually uh, just addresses. So there is like 30 million points, and every point is an address in France. And you can see that if you look at residential mobility, so just when people uh, change addresses, uh, where they can move is highly structured and constrained by this point. But these ones are also a good proxy for geography. Like if we zoom on the southeast, uh, you can see that there is the Alps, and you see that people will only live in the valleys and, and not where the mountains are. And just after the Alps, you have a river going down, which is the Rhone. And here, a lot of people are going to live because it's good for industry, trade, etc. Same thing if we go a bit more east, uh, we can see uh, kind of by negative that there is a river going down and, and big cities around it. And the structure of the kind of geography and also the built environment is very uh, multi scale because if you zoom on, on Paris, uh, you will see first you see the river, then you see the big boulevard, and then you see the thinner and thinner scale of the cities. And you, the point here that I'm trying to make is that not the whole space is available for people to move to. You can see that, I mean, there's a lot of white parts in. In, in this plot, and the part that is available to, which is the dark part, is also highly structured. And so um, let's look at the data. So <clears throat> most of the data will be uh, on, on Denmark. And so, as I said, uh, it's the registry data. So we have every residential move in Denmark since 1986. So it's um, around 40 million moves. And on top of that, so it's moved between precise uh, addresses. We have also the location data of each of the addresses as the, with like the doorstep coordinates, and it has um, plus minus two meter precision, which is quite um, interesting because usually uh, GPS data doesn't have the same precision. It's more around 50 meters, so sometimes a bit less. And so now that we have from where to where people move and we have the location of these places, uh, we can just plot the distribution of this moving distance. And the question um, in the literature sometimes is, is this distribution of power law? And now when you look so at this uh, distribution, it clearly doesn't look like a power law. Maybe it's a piecewise power law, but it's not clearly a power law. And also another thing in it is that there is like tiny fluctuation and you could think of them as noise, but again, I mean, there's 40 million points, so maybe they are significant. And more, more, the biggest one, uh, I guess you see my, my, mouse, my mouse, right? The biggest one around here, um, between 150 and, and 200 kilometers actually corresponds to the distance between the biggest cities in Denmark, so it's distance between Copenhagen and Odense, Copenhagen and Aarhus, or Odense and Aalborg. And so that's why you see more people moving from these two distances. But it also hints at the fact that maybe we should take into account geography when we plot this line of the distance distribution. And so kind of 
the whole point of the talk can be summarized in this slide is that the observed mobility, so this distance distribution, we're going to show it as a product of two things. One is going to be geography, and the other one is going to be named the intrinsic distance cost, which is basically the charge that people make. And so the question is, how are we going to take into account geography now? So let's think about uh, a toy model um, where we live, all of us, um, we are like one big family, and we live on the white cross in the middle, and then we live on this uh, perfectly circular island where the uh, other location, other houses, are just uh, arranged in concentric circles. And if we are all of us going to leave this house and going uh, uniformly at random to another house, um, how is our distance distribution going to look like? And it's just going to be, if we move uniformly, the distance of points to the center. But then what happens already and is interesting is that some distances are not attainable. Uh, we cannot move of half a radius in silent because there's no houses at half the radius. And so if you study mobility from this houses, you should take that into account. But then um, in a more realistic setting, uh, in all of the other houses, all of the other dots, there's also people living and they might also move to any other addresses. And so what we did for the black cross, we also need to do it for every other dot. So we need to compute the distance between every dot and every other dot, which is what you would call in computer science, the pairwise distance between points, and what you call in a condensed matter physics, the pair distribution function. And that's how it looks like for uh, this toy example. And uh, what we're going to argue next is that this uh, truly uh, captures geography and I mean, the best thing I could say now is that you see this tiny fluctuation in the pair distribution function that you expect due to the concentric arrangement of the circles. But now that we kind of know how to take geography, uh, we can go back to our example with real data from Denmark. So this is the distance, distance, distance uh, distribution. And then uh, we can add uh, the pairwise distribution function between all of the addresses in Denmark. And so now we have uh, these two lines that uh, looked a bit random, but let's see what we can do with that. Uh, we said earlier that mobility was the product of geography times people choice, but now we have the mobility by the empirical data, we find a way of having geography. So maybe by uh, just doing that, uh, dividing one by the other, we can recover people's choice. So let's do that. Uh, we take the orange line and we're just going to divide it by, by the blue line. And what we get is that. And um, so we get a straight line, like kind of power law. It's not a power law distribution because it's not a distribution. It's a relation, it's a ratio between two distribution. But this is remarkable for three things. Uh, first of all, is that this line is very straight. Um, like if you try to draw some parallels around it, you see that it doesn't go very far away from, from the, um, yeah, from how straight it is. Uh, second of all, it's straight over uh, five orders of magnitude, so kind of applied from 10 meters all the way to a thousand kilometer or one million meter. And finally, if you do a maximum likelihood fit on this uh, power law by normalizing it by the distribution, uh, you get an exponent, an exponent that is uh, around one or around minus one. And so uh, if we take a step back, uh, what, what this means, um, so the orange line is how people move uh, empirically, it's the data. The blue line, it's how we take into account geography, but an interpretation of it is also how people, how the distribution of movement, so how people would move if they were to move uniformly. So it's kind of a new model, but it's very unrealistic. But then what separates uh, the, uniform random move to the real groups is just one of the distance. So it's kind of as if uh, people, when they change, when they choose a new house, they have a cost that grows as one, that grows as, as a distance or like a utility, a utility that decrease as one of the distance. And uh, that's great, but um, the question is also like, this is just for Denmark, does it generalize to, to other countries? 
And uh, I mean, as you've seen earlier, uh, we had uh, location data for friends. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the movement distribution from friends, the movement data is not as good. We just have movements uh, between cities. So basically the orange distance distribution is, is truncated. But on the part where we have data, we see that uh, this relation still holds. The fit is not as good as the exponent is a bit higher than one, but it's still pretty good. Uh, and then we're like, okay, but this is still residential mobility. This is not the most interesting kind of mobility. What about uh, other types of mobility? And so we looked at day-to-day -day mobility between points of interest. So like kind of like the, the most common type of, of human mobility. And so we, we did this for San Francisco, Houston, and Singapore. And again, uh, the picture stays the same. Uh, this time, the exponent of bit lower than one, uh, it goes all the way to 0 0.9. Uh, but the fit uh, are still pretty good, uh, considering that I mean, the amount of data in this example is uh, two or three orders of magnitude less than in the case of, of Denmark and, and France, because you have less movement data usually than if you look at residential mobility. But so we kind of see that this thing that we see is happening everywhere. And another thing that you might have noticed is in all of these plots, so this one, this one, and this four, and even the French one is back again, uh, you see that the blue line, the pairwise distance distribution that is supposed to encode geography, uh, kind of always has the same shape. So there's a lot of fluctuation at the beginning when it's a straight line of some exponent, and then it goes down quickly at, as we reach the end of the system. And the reason why it's always the same is because geographies are uh, quite similar um, at the size of city uh, around the world. And this is kind of what we're going to, to do now. We're going to kind of go a bit sideways and stop talking about mobility for a while. And we are just going to talk about uh, distribution of houses. So uh, and we're going to show that it encodes geography. So, um, on this plot, you have two lines. So the first, the big one in, in teal, is a is a pair distribution function for uh, buildings, and the one in gray is for addresses. And you can just think of, of addresses as uh, of buildings as addresses stacked on top of each other. So think you have an apartment building has many addresses. And actually, the most interesting one is the one of the addresses in, in gray. And in in this. Um, in this plot, we will uh, kind of we can kind of see three regimes. Uh, the first regime is the neighborhood regime from a meter to a, a bit uh, to around fifty meters. Then we go inside the cities regime, so it's like approximately hundred meters all the way to a few kilometers, five kilometers for the biggest city in Denmark. And so it's a bit when the size of city is distributed. And then finally, we have the third regime, which is kind of the country country scale regime or what happened between cities or intercity regime. And so we're going to, to look at them uh, one by one, and we'll start with the neighborhood regime. And so what you can see in this one is that the, the gray line has kind of a linear onset, but that is modulated by oscillation. And the first oscillation is at six meters, then it goes down, and then it goes up again at, at 12 meters. And it kind of means that you are more likely to find another house close to where you are if you are in a house at six meters. And then you are less likely, and then you are more likely again at 12 meters. And so this should uh, make you think about uh, physics, crystallography, or, like, or particle interact, and it's exactly what we are going to do. So uh, we are going to compare the data to three models of, of particles. And um, on the line plot, the, the data is in black, and every color plot is one of the models. And so let's start with the ideal gas in orange. And so an ideal gas is where we assume that the particles are just distributed uniformly at random, or the houses are usually are distributed uniformly at random. And though this implies that the pair distribution function just has a linear growth. And this is what you can see in the first line plot. Uh, the second plot is the pair correlation function or radial distribution function. It's just the, the one above uh, divided by 
um, divided by the ideal guess. So we kind of normalize by the ideal guess, which means that if you are above one, uh, you are more likely to find a, whole, a house there than at random, and if you are below one, you are less likely to find a house. And so we can see that the ideal gas is, is just straight line, and they are oscillating. And so the first model is kind of the canonical model in, in condensed matter physics for, for particles, is the uh, Lennar Jones disk model. And this model kind of only has two things, uh, which is uh, Repulsion, very strong repulsion at so distance, and then attraction at distance by a tiny bit higher. And this is kind of qualitatively also what happened between houses because you do have a decrease in cost by having neighbors close to you. Like you can share uh, sewers, electricity. So you, there's a lot of things you can share by having people nearby. But in the meantime, you don't want people to live too close to you because you still maybe want to have a house that has a certain size or you want to have a garden or whatever, but there's a lot of things that will impose minimal distance or where your neighbor can live from you. And so this kind of emulates that, but what you can see if you compare in the, in the line plot, the uh, purple line and the dark line is that the oscillation of the linear trans model are much more stronger. And so when we try to compare it to another model, which is just an attractive hard disk model that you can kind of consider as a Leonard Jones model as very uh, low temperature where the disk have a, a, a tendency to form cluster. And you can see that this is uh, a bit closer to the data, although it seems that the data is kind of something in between these two models. But so this is kind of what happened at the micro scale. And this is why houses are water because these models are uh, usually used uh, to, mo to model water molecules. And then uh, let's look at what happened in the uh, third regime, so the intercity scale regime. And so our first idea was thinking that maybe what happened for houses can be completely modeled for cities. Maybe cities attract and repel each other like houses do. Uh, turn outs, it turns out it's not the case. Um, so here it's kind of the same setup of, of the plots, uh, but we're only going to compare it with two models. And, and the data is the plot, is the line plot where we have the tiny dots. And so the first model in orange, again, ideal gas. So we take the map of Denmark and we just put uh, points uniformly at random and it's, And if we compare this with the location of cities, you see that for short distance, so below 10 km, below five kilometers, uh, usually you're not likely to find a city close to a river city. But then after five kilometers, the position of cities is the same as if it was random. And uh, so when the model we use is just a uh, hard disk model where we have disks that have different size because cities have different size, but this disk, the only constraint they have is that they should not overlap. So you can just throw them at random and then run some collision detection algorithm. And so this is the lines you have in the plot in, in, in purple and, and pink. Uh, the only difference between the purple and pink is uh, how much we uh, weight by the city size. So the one in purple is just the position. The one in, uh, in lighter purple or pink is uh, city position weighted by the number of buildings or by the size of the city, which is almost the same. And you can see here that, yeah, basically cities, position of cities are, are random, except that they should not overlap. And then finally, uh, there is uh, the regime in the middle, which is the most interesting because what happened is that uh, this pairwise distance is, uh, has kind of a power law of uh, two thirds of 0 0.66. And the reason why this happened is because uh, cities are not uh, perfectly circular or, I don't know, a square. They usually have, as you can see below, some very weird shape and you can find in literature a lot of things that would tell you cities as have a fractal shape. And so by just um, taking the model we had in the first part in the interaction between the houses and imposing this in some in some fractal shape, uh, we kind of recover uh, this two for exponent. But I'm going to go uh, quickly on this one, sorry. So this is uh, kind of the whole part on, on, on geography, and, and we will use all of this again later. But now let's go back to um, 
the, the moving and um, the human mobility part. So I, I showed you this earlier, and I, I don't know how much how much you're familiar with human mobility, but if there is something that is like one over the distance, uh, it sounds a lot uh, like the gravity law. And uh, you could argue that this is just a gravity law, but actually uh, it's kind of a continuous uh, gravity law. So uh, what we have in this toy example is two cities, city one and city two, that have different radius, R1 and R2, and they are separated by a distance D. And, and the catch here is that the distance D is uh, very large compared to the radius of the cities. And so the original uh, gravity law model, it says that the probability of moving from city one to city two is proportional to the product of the population between the two cities divided by the distance. So N1 and N2 is how many people live in city one and city two. And in our case, what we did is we are saying that the probability of moving from city one from city two, which is the probability of moving of distance D, uh, is uh, the intrinsic moving law times the pairwise distance distribution times the geography. And we've seen empirically that this intrinsic moving law is just one over the distance. And so then the question is, what's going to be the pairwise distance distribution at distance D? And so it's going to be the number of pairs you can make from two houses that are separated by distance D. And so if you take a house in city one, you will have basically the number of houses there is in city two pairs you can make. But because you can do this for every houses of city one, you just see that the product uh, N1, N2 emerge. And here we need uh, proportionality constants because the number of houses is proportional to the number of people living in the city. And then the, the last thing we have is a direct distribution is because uh, obviously you, for this to be true, you need the radius of the city to be completely negligible. And so if you're not fully convinced uh, by what I said, if it was not so clear, uh, here is how a plot would look like if you would really put uh, houses in this. And you will have uh, the first part of the blue line is the pairs within the cities. And then there's no, and this distribution goes to zero because there is no pairs you can make. There's nothing in between the cities. And then it, it goes uh, a bit like a Dirac, but not yet because uh, the radius are not completely negligible. But so this is kind of to kind of show that we can interpret uh, our finding as a continuous gravity law. Uh, the thing is, then we were a bit uh, underwhelmed by that, and we wanted to see whether or not it's more than just a gravity law. And so what we did is that we started to look at the same thing on dividing the movement by geography, but city by city. And so what you have in this plot, it's a small city and a large city. And the movements are the movement from the city of interest to the rest of the country. And the pairwise distribution are, the, are made of pairs that contains at least one, one house in the, in the city of interest. So if you think about the pairwise distance distribution as a matrix between all the pairs you can make, we just take the rows that correspond to, to the city that we're looking at. And so when we do the same thing of dividing the orange line by the blue line, uh, we get this picture now. We, we don't get a power law anymore, but we get a piecewise power law. And it turns out that this piecewise power law uh, happens, uh, we can see it in most of the cities. Uh, so this is a bunch of cities in Denmark, and you can see that we see this piecewise thing everywhere. And then uh, we kind of looked at what are the exponents we see um, on the first part and the second part, and also where is the transition happening. And so if we plot the distribution of the exponents, so the one in, in light till is the first exponent, uh, it's a distribution that is pretty narrow with a mean around 0 0.6, and the other one is also narrow and it has a mean around uh, 2 or, or minus 2. And then, um, we looked also at the distribution of the transition point in, in this um, piecewise power law, and we can see that this distribution is, lies in between a log normal and a power Pareto distribution. And it makes sense because we you can interpret it as a city size. And so uh, we're happy because this kind of show that what's happening is, is a bit more than the, the gravity law. 
But uh, then a question that comes is how do you go at the scales of city from this piecewise process to this clean uh, one over our line when it's not clear that aggregating um, this piecewise things should result to that. And so to, to do this, uh, what we need is we need all of the thing we did with, with the geography. So the first, so because we need to, so basically let's go back to, to this plot. Uh, so we, what we're going to do is we're going to assume that everyone from the city, they move as this piecewise thing. And, and now to, to be able to aggregate, we need to assume uh, something on the pair distribution function of each city. So the blue line for each of the city. And to do that, we're going to use the insights uh, we, we got from, from geography. And so the first one we had was, was this thing of the interaction and it has uh, like the small scale interaction and it has the effect that all of the cities, so this is the pair distribution for each cities, but just the cities. And we can see that they kind of all follow the same distribution, almost, which is a, a generalized gamma distribution. And so this is how a generalized gamma distribution looks in a linear plot, and but this is how it looks on a log log plot. And so we're going to assume that each city has this has this generalized gamma distribution. And then we need to assume something for what happened uh, beyond the city limits, all the way to, to the size that corresponds to the size of Denmark. But we also seen that cities are an ideal gas. And so basically we can just assume that the rest of the country is randomly distributed, which means that we just assume a linear growth of the pair distribution function, which is how it looks like. And then uh, what we're going to do is, uh, yeah, sorry. So they, here you can look at, if you look at the blue line, um, blue lines, you can see that they roughly follow this kind of shape. Very, it's very rough. And for the second part, beyond the city limit, it's actually not the case because usually for the cities, uh, Copenhagen is somewhere for them at some distance. And so there's a spike where Copenhagen is. But because on average, Copenhagen is going to be not distributed the same place, uh, it's kind of like if they had a linear growth. And so now what we're going to do is we take our behavioral piecewise power law, we take this uh, thing that we designed from the geography, we multiply the two of them and we aggregate it over, we sum it over all of the cities, but keep in mind that uh, the cities have also different scales. So where the transition happened and where the size of the city stops is also different. And we take it distributed as a power of parity or as a parity or distribution. And when, if we do that, and then we divide it by the global pairwise distribution, uh, we get the line in the bottom, which is, Basically, we recover uh, this one over the distance uh, plot. And the colors on the plot is uh, what you have in, in light teal is what happened within the city. In pink is where city are distributed. And the darker teal is uh, interaction between the city or between the city scale. And uh, that's uh, kind of the end of the third part and also the, the end of the talk. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, fascinating work, really. Uh, I presume we have a round of comments and questions from the audience. If, so if I can if, start, yeah. I can say hi to Sune. Uh, really impressive work. Do you hear me? Yes, yes. Good. Okay, very good. So, really nice piece of work. Thanks a lot for presenting. So, I, I, I really wanted to hear this story. Uh, yeah, what I'm what I was sort of thinking about this is it's kind of fascinating to me that everything here comes from the numbers, you know, right? So you have you have uh, your pairwise distance distributions, you have your cities, you have their size in, uh, and then then the sort of cost of moving from somewhere to somewhere else comes from everything comes from that. So in in a way, this is. This is like a really a mechanistic model that doesn't include agents in any possible way, right? So, so, so whether people want to do this or whether they want to do that, it's not in. Unlike, for example, in the radiation model where you have these 
intervening opportunities that you want to go somewhere and then you kind of pick the place that's where you don't have an alternative on the way, which is a very different way of looking at things. So I'm kind of, yeah, I'm, I'm surprised that things match this kind of mechanistic view so well that, that there, is, there, is, there is really no need for this sort of explanation. What I'm wondering is, and, and I'm sort of just finding this as a future, possible future thing to look at, is that if one would find some deviations from this, would that be <coughs> indicative of something? Now, suppose that, that, that you would have a situation where then Denmark is not like that, but suppose that Denmark, parts of Denmark are so culturally different that people don't want to move from A to B. You would be seeing this as some sort of signal of deviation from this mechanistic way of... Because this is exactly the case in Finland, if you look at Finland, and this is why I'm kind of uh, thinking that we should sort of apply these things here. We have a, this sort of a division between Eastern and Western Finland that that people don't even realize, but there appears to be a bit sort of less mobility across the country in the east-west direction than in the north-south direction. Mm -hmm. That's the sort of one cultural, one part of the process, one part of the and, and and I think that might be visible. That's at least one case where I can think of this mechanistic idea will probably not hold, but this it's very interesting to see whether there is a, yeah, whether there is a deviation from from this, but yeah, really, really, really interesting work. So thanks, thanks for presenting. Thank you. Yeah, um, so one of the nice thing uh, I could say is that because of the registry data, we have a lot of demographic information. Mm -hmm. And and also uh, we were not very careful with, with time. Uh, we aggregated everything. Uh, it's not sure that this uh, one of the distance law will hold over the whole time scale, or if we divide by, I don't know, gender or by age, maybe things are different and it's something we're going to look at. Yeah, yeah, very good. And then maybe maybe also things like, like if you think of um, social economy, and if you look at the smaller scales, and then if you look at mobility, then you would find that people don't move from this part of the city to that part of the city because you know different people live there. So some, some, yeah, this yes. this whole analysis would be very useful for spotting such deviations. That huh, there's something here because it doesn't conform to this picture. So so this would act as a sort of baseline, you know, expectation that exactly if something doesn't follow this expectation, then you have something of, of big interest. Yeah. So uh, maybe there's a tiny thing I, I can say about um, about actually this plot and um, income or like uh, wealth. So there's something I, I forgot to say. Uh, when we have the piecewise thing, uh, we can interpret it a bit, which I forgot. Uh, but what happened is that the slope, which is 0 0.6, is the slope within the city. And it means that when while, while you are still moving within the city, distance does not matter so much. Whereas when the slope is minus two is when you're moving outside the city, and now distance matters a lot to you. Mm -hmm. And what we did is uh, we looked at the different uh, the difference in the house prices uh, when people move within the city and when people move from a city to another city. And what happened, it's it's not a very strong signal, why it's not in the paper, but it's still there, is that when people move within the same city, they usually move to a better house, to a house that is more expensive. So they just want to have an upgrade. Whereas when people move to another city, it's it's kind of it's more random and it's more the same. I mean the mean is is almost zero and basically means that people maybe just need to reallocate somewhere to find a new job and they just going to the first house they can and the budget is the same and they're not always looking for an improvement. Oh so, yeah. Very good facts. <clears throat> Anyone else? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there seem to be no immediate questions. I would have actually had very similar questions in a way because I have a 
my personal background is more in social sciences, so I would have never thought, in a way, I would have never approached the whole question from this perspective, but finding like more of a general theory that seems to explain uh, mobility across cities. So that's that's something, of course, and, and very fancy work uh, in overall. Okay, I think it's one, two, noon and uh unless there are any additional questions or any any urgent things so i, would... I just want to thank you again for doing this talk to thank you for a very interesting talk and uh everything for the best have a nice nice summer thank you Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. okay <coughs>